Good afternoon, and welcome to OSSEE's Spring Literacy Convening. My name is Dr. Siobhan Gibson, and I proudly serve as the Assistant Superintendent of Teaching and Learning at OSSEE. We are so delighted to have you join us for what is sure to be an afternoon of deep engagement, reflection, and planning for DC's teachers, learners, and students. To ground our time together, I'd like to offer a few statistics regarding literacy. Did you know that, according to the 2019 National Assessment of Educational Progress, 35% of fourth graders, 34% of eighth graders, and 37% of 12th graders performed at or above NAEP proficiency levels in reading. And since 1992, proficiency rates in the nation have remained relatively flat. Those jarring data remind us of the imperative to support all students reading on grade level. In reflecting on my own life, I knew about illiteracy before I knew about literacy. I would often tag along as my grandmother would support an elderly gentleman named Mr. Bohannon at the Bedford branch of the Brooklyn Public Library. Upon arriving at the library, my grandmother would hurry me along to browse the books so that she could provide Mr. Bohannon instructions so that he could learn to read. After many weekly trips, I finally inquired of my grandmother, Mama, why do we meet Mr. Bohannon at the library all the time? She said, because I'm teaching him to read. I couldn't understand how an adult didn't know how to read. My grandmother later explained that during Mr. Bohannon's day, he didn't have the opportunity to go to school like me to learn to read. So as a retiree, he decided to take the step to become a literate adult. I don't know then if I knew it, but perhaps my grandmother was foreshadowing for me what I was called to do many years later in my life when I became a teacher. We know that literacy opens doors and opportunity for freedom. So in the summer of 2022, Asi pursued the U.S. Department of Education Comprehensive Literacy State Development Grant, also known as the CLSD, and was thus awarded $16 million to deepen investment in literacy for all learners first through grade 12 in the district. Through the CLSD grant, Asi specifically plans to leverage funds to support early literacy and literacy skills, increase the number of children reading on grade level in grades three through high school, and improve literacy outcomes for disadvantaged and traditionally underserved children and students. In addition to investing in children and students across the district, a portion of CLSD funds will also be utilized to strengthen the educator workforce and provide statewide literacy professional development. Last year, OSSEE began CLSD grant activities. A major milestone was the creation of the District of Columbia Statewide Comprehensive Literacy Plan, known as the CLP. A group of over 50 dedicated educators, higher education professionals, and practitioners came together to write this CLP, a document which connects the research to evidence-based practices for effective instruction. Through the CLP process, OSSEE established a vision for literacy, which is that all learners ages birth through grade 12 in the District of Columbia will have access to high quality literacy instruction and early experiences. Furthermore, the CLP established guiding principles, principles for literacy, which are inclusive instruction, assessment, multi-tiered supports, and professional learning. The CLP reflects the district's commitment to and belief that all children across the district's diversity of communities, families, cultures, language, and abilities have the capacity to and can, with the right instruction and supports, become successful readers. In the fall of 2021, OSSEE awarded seven subgrantees funding to support their individual efforts to advance literacy practices within community-based organizations and schools. The DC CLSD subgrantees receive funding to target literacy through a range of strategies, such as literacy curriculum, staffing, instructional materials, professional development, and high impact tutoring. More than 8,800 students will be impacted by the dissemination of these funds. For many of us, reading allows us to escape our current context and see the world through a different lens, or reading allows us to grow deeper into bodies of knowledge. And we know being literate also provides other opportunities in life, such as family sustaining wages. As we enter a period of recovery and reimagining education from the COVID-19 pandemic, we know that our charge is heightened and magnified. Today's convening brings together educators from pre-K through grade 12 and content experts from across the district 
to share promising and best practices. Over the past few months, members of the OSSE Division of Teaching and Learning and colleagues from across the district, who you'll hear from later today, came together to develop the content and programming for today's convening. I would like to thank the planning committee of Andrea Barbie, Selena Kettleson, Annette Thacker Bartlett, Santiago Sanchez, and the leadership of Megan Dumond for their tireless work behind the scenes to plan for today's event. We will begin with a panel discussion moderated by the state superintendent, Dr. Christina Grant, followed by your choice of breakout sessions on a host of pertinent literacy topics. I want to thank you for taking the time to learn, engage with us today, and wish you a great afternoon of reflection. Without further delay, I'd like to introduce the District of Columbia State Superintendent, Dr. Christina Grant, and our panel of esteemed guests. Oh, thank you so much, Dr. Gibson. Um, I don't know if it was just for me, but didn't it feel like you were with a really good literacy teacher? I could see little Siobhan at the library um, learning alongside her grandma. And so first, you know, it's important to just honor the role that adults play in our lives as we go on this literacy journey. It's directly linked to our mission of what it means to have access to a high quality literacy instruction. It is what happens in the school, but it is also what happens in community. And so Dr. Gibson, just thank you for the way you set the tone for this conversation. Um, again, I'm Dr. Christina Grant. I have the joy and privilege of serving as the State Superintendent of Education in Washington, D.C. We have just crossed the 100 person mark of individuals who have joined us this afternoon. I mean, you know, you can't tell me that reading isn't life because on a rainy day, everyone is coming together to have this critical conversation. Um, it's my pleasure, uh, and I've had the opportunity to get to know a little bit about our six panelists for today's opening session. Um, they have a rich and diverse set of experiences that bring us to this table, and I do think that collectively we are going to kick off today uh, with the right tone. Um, I will do a little job of trying to introduce you all, but please uh, tell us your name, a little bit more about your role, and in the spirit of why we're gathered here today, tell me what your favorite childhood book is. Uh, mine is The Giving Tree by Shel Silks. Um, Representative Alistair Chang, who happens to serve as the Ward 2 member of the DC State Board of Education, um, but loves literacy uh, in ways that are near and dear to his heart, had an opportunity to learn more about his literacy journey, but he really does serve as a great partner in this work. So welcome, Representative Chang. Thank you so much, Dr. Grant. It is great to be with you all today. As Dr. Grant shared, I'm the Ward 2 member on the DC State Board of Education. I joined last January, where my top priority is to, to work with Aussie partners and other literacy stakeholders across the city to advance literacy. I'm also an advisory board member of the Library of Congress Literacy Awards and uh, have gotten to work on literacy mostly with public libraries in the past and school librarians. There's a group I wanna give a shout out to to answer your question, Dr. Grant, called the Red Fred Project that publishes children's books authored by children living with life-threatening diseases. And their stories are a legacy for their communities, but also some of the most joyful and insightful stories I've read. Um, and I highly recommend folks uh, to check out their work. Thank you. I feel like if we could, if you could drop the resource in the chat, I know that individuals would want to, to learn a bit more. Um, our next panelist needs no introduction, as I hope everyone across the district has gotten to know and love her as much as we have at OSSE. With further ado, Ms. Dominique Foster is a pre-K teacher at Friendship Public Charter School, Bo Pierce campus. But uh, it's near and dear to my heart. She is the 2021 DC Teacher of the Year. And so welcome and thank you for joining us in this space. Thank you so much, Dr. Grant. And hello and good afternoon to everyone. I'm super excited to join. And as she said, I work at Friendship Public Charter School, Blow Pierce Campus as a pre-K-4 teacher and specialist. Uh, and just so excited. Uh, to be here today. So my favorite book, uh, I would say there's so many, but I'm going to go with Tiki Tiki Tembo uh, by Arlene Moselle. 
Uh, and it wasn't just the book. The book is great. It was me remembering how my third grade teacher read the book. It was Tiki Tiki Timbo, No So Real. Every time we read it. Uh, yes, and I see so many people. Love, love, love that story. Uh, and I thought, oh my goodness, I haven't read this story to my children in years. So we're going to read it soon. So yes, that's one of my favorites. You don't even know how I have just thought of like, what would it be if you did a nighttime reading session oh, for us? Like there's gotta be some virtual like bedtime reading story. So I'm down. Let's folks do. in the room with me have heard my request, but I, I am I am all in. We should set up some, oh uh, yeah, I have I have an idea, but okay, it's not for the subject of this panel. Um, next up, certainly um, Allison Williams serves as the Deputy Chief of Content and Curriculum at DC Public Schools. Uh, just an amazing partner in this work under the leadership of Chancellor Faraby. Uh, welcome, Allison, and, and tell us a little bit more. What's your favorite book? Um, thank you for the introduction. And yes, Dominique, I was right there with you with Tiki Tiki Timbo, No Saw Rimbo, Chari Bari, Ruchi Pip. And then I was like, what's the rest of it? Um, love, love, love that book. Um, I do have the pleasure to work with DC Public Schools. I also went to DC Public Schools. I will, fo will forever be a first grade teacher at heart. That's what I spent the longest time doing um, over my career. My favorite book, I'm going to go with the book that I most love to read to my three boys uh, when they were youngest. Um, and that is Are You My Mother by P.D. Eastman. And that's how they would read it when they would you know, pretend read. Um, that is my absolute favorite. Thanks. I see something happening with this book, y'all. You don't believe me just yet. Uh, next up, we have Emily Hammett, another family member from DC Public Schools. She serves as the director of English Language Arts and Social Studies. Um, welcome, welcome to the, are you gonna, you gotta join us now. You know, the standard has been set, but welcome. Tell us a little bit more about yourself and your favorite book. Hello, everyone. Thank you for the welcome. I'm sorry. I'm gonna bring. I'm gonna bring the uh, the rhythm down. Um, I, my my book was a little less rhythmless, um, but I'm so happy to work for DC Public Schools. Um, going here, uh, being here about eight years already. Um, I am originally from Miami, Florida, and why this is my favorite book series um, is because I remember going with my mom to Walden Books, and every time we went to the mall and we visited Walden Books. I was able to get a new Berenstain Bears book. Um, and this brought so much joy to my heart. Um, and so I had all the Berenstain books. Um, and I just love Stan and Jan Berenstain and reading about you know, all the misadventures and all the morals and, and, and being a good person, right? Um, so I absolutely love those books. I'm happy to be here. Oh, now you're bringing back like chapter book series. That's my jam. I was a middle school teacher and so um, all, all things little chapter books. Uh, joining us next is Megan Gavin. Uh, Garvin, I'm so sorry, who's the lead academic accelerator at KIPP DC. I, lots of love for KIPP because I was a KIPP teacher. Uh, I tell people I'm a KIPPster for life. Um, welcome, Megan. Tell us a little bit more about you and your favorite book. Thank you, Dr. Grant. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Megan Garvin. I've been an educator in the district for the past 10 years. At KIPP DC, I am a member of the Regional Literacy Coaching Team, and I am currently leading the brand new Literacy Acceleration Program at KIPP DC, which I'm so excited to share a little bit more about here shortly. And my favorite childhood book was Angelina Ballerina and that whole series. I would solely stand up and attempt to give the book justice, but then you all would kick me off as host. Um, last, certainly not least, Carol Line. Did I get it right? Look at God. Yes. Yeah, I'm gonna mess up the middle. Is it? Oh gosh, why did we go over your last name? You just say it, all the all the letters. Say all the consonants. So M Wenda M Wendua Wendua. Look at that literacy. You see how it works? Exactly. One to one. Um, Baker is the K through two literacy director at Two Rivers Public Charter School. And thank you for being here, Caroline. So focused on the beginning of the name. Didn't even dawn on me that I would struggle. Um, tell us more about what brings you to the stage and your favorite book. Thank you so much, Dr. Grant. Um, I'm really honored to be here and to be amongst you today. 
Um, as she shared, my name is Caroline Wendwa Baker, and um, I'm originally from Tanzania, so that's where that name comes from. Uh, but I've been in the United States for a really long time, and uh, my educational career has been within the charter world, the charter landscape for over 20 years. And um, I absolutely love literacy, started as literacy uh, early childhood teacher um, and have made full circle through all the, all the different roles to come back and really zoom in on something that I'm really passionate about, which is um, literacy for everyone. My favorite uh, childhood book, actually it's a book that I've read to my two kids a lot. Um, and it is a play on words because I do love a play on words and vocabulary and some rhythm and some rhyme. So Chica Chica Boom Boom was something that we always read and um, my kids really absolutely loved that, um, that rhythm and that excitement there. So as you all can see, as we are closing, as we are closing in on over 125 participants, uh, we have really brought together the best thinkers in Washington, D.C., uh, in a cross-section of experiences um, and a love of rhythmic instruction, which I think we should, I'm going to continue to push on that, that are gathered here today. Um, I am going to stop talking and let you all hear directly from our panelists and start with our first question. So our comprehensive literacy plan, which you heard Dr. Gibson frame a little bit about, it really lays out a vision for all for literacy for all of our learners based on these guiding principles around instruction, assessment, multi-tiered systems of support, and professional learning. When you think about those guiding principles coming into play, can I hear from, I'd say, three of you around, how does that play out in the district and in your specific LEA? And just for individuals um, watching, we're going to kind of monitor air voice. And so for this question, I would love for Alistair to weigh in from a district perspective. And then if Allison and Caroline, if you could share how that looks and sounds in your respective LEAs, that'll be a good way to kick us off. So Alistair, get us started. Great, thank you. I am a big fan of the Comprehensive Literacy Plan, uh, which I think we'll call the CLP moving forward. And this convening is so important and this is a great question to start with Dr. Grant. I recently had an opportunity to conduct research with UNESCO's Institute for Lifelong Learning, looking at hundreds of literacy plans from around the world, and can confidently say that our plan in DC is the most aligned to the latest academic research, which gives us a super strong evidence-based foundation to make smart literacy investments in DC, and that, that really excites me. My colleagues and I on the DC State Board of Education have been aligning our work to the CLP by convening panels of literacy experts and practitioners and getting feedback from reading instructors and families as part of our constituent engagement work. And we've been particularly interested in learning from states like Mississippi, Alabama, and Tennessee that have seen significant growth in their literacy outcomes in recent years. And one thread really stands out for us and for me that and this is, this is obvious to everyone on, on this call, I think, that just because you know how to read does not mean that you know how to teach reading, right? And so for me and, and from, from many of the folks that we've gotten a chance to speak with from across the district and from other states, one thing that stands out from the CLP that, that really uh, encourages our work is that it sets a really strong foundation for investments in, in structured literacy programs like the DC Reading Clinic and the language essentials for teachers of reading and spelling or, or letters for short. What also stands out for, for me is that the, the CLP lays clear that there's no silver bullet, right? That it's absolutely critical to align this, not only these, these investments in teacher training, but, but also you know, align that with curriculum and assessments. So, Funding for a universal, for a screener like, like Dibbles, for example, is, is most helpful if instructors know how to interpret those results and are authorized and equipped by their school leaders to actually customize their learning opportunities for students accordingly. Allison? Thank you. Um, and thank you for this question. I really do feel like it frames all of the work um, that we do, uh, especially this year. But it's not really new from most years. Um, I think 
The best way to answer this question is to share our district's approach to what we've heard increasingly uh, termed as acceleration or accelerating learning um, for our students. And I think it's important to, to define acceleration. It's, it's really important to differentiate between acceleration and remediation. Um, we know that every year, uh, while this year it's quite exacerbated, that students come back to us with gaps in their learning. Um, and many times those gaps, you know, act as barriers or they, they show up as barriers because they are specific to like prerequisite skills that kiddos need to access the grade level content. And so with an acceleration approach, what we believe in DCPS is as part of our planning process that we support teachers with, is we help them to identify as they're planning, looking at upcoming standards and skills that are expected to be taught within the grade level content, and then identifying each of their students' varied entry points to that content so that they are able to plan lessons um, and also provide students with opportunities to both learn the grade level, but also sharpen and integrate those missed, uh, missed learning gaps as well within the context of the grade level. Um, uh, learning so that it feels organic, if you will. Um, with remediation, sometimes one might think I need to go teach all of the missed learning before I even hit uh, grade level. And that 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 we strongly believe is would be a, a huge misstep. I think to do this um, as an ELA, I can highlight three main points. Um, one is through our tier one instruction. Um, you know, leveraging diagnostics. I mean, Alistair, I love that you mentioned Dibbles. It is the hallmark of how we are really driving that early literacy instruction um, to help teachers have a coherent picture as to where their, their kiddos are. Um, we really are emphasizing small group instruction to ensure that the kiddos' needs are actually being attended to individually um, and leveraging a combination of uh, our assessments, um, instructional measures, interventions, so that we can keep a pulse, right, um, of where kids are as we're adjusting tier one to make sure that we are both addressing gaps and grade level. So I think that would be the first point. The second would be something in the question that speaks specifically to the professional development, right? We've got to make sure our teaching force is armed to do this work. I, I really feel like this year, more than any, our teachers are, are charged with becoming diagnosticians and it's a complex job. And so we're arm in arm working with them um, to learn how do we take Dibble's progress monitoring data and benchmark data and really take that and build lessons that are strategic for our students. Um, and then lastly, I would say through the multiple tiers of support, right? So, so when we think about all those uh, pieces that I spoke to in the tier one classroom, there are still some kiddos that those needs are not going to be fully met within that context. And so they do need additional and extended learning time. And so we do that through tier two, uh, additional small group opportunities outside of the tier one classroom, and then with tier three with high dosage tutoring. Um, and we are showing uh, some great, great impacts of these efforts um, when we're looking at and comparing our beginning of year data to how our kiddos are showing up um, at the middle of the year. So we're excited to uh, work with this group and keep moving forward um, and see where we all end up at the end of year. Now, Allison, you know that I love that you referenced that $40 million investment that we're making in high impact tutoring, um, but your framing is just so spot on, especially differentiating between remediation and acceleration. Um, you can acknowledge the need to grow and grow at the same time. And I think a lot of instructors need to know that. Uh, Caroline, round us out on this topic. Thank you. And so at Two Rivers, I see these guiding principles really coming into play in two ways. So first through uh, the adoption of uh, a tier one, high quality tier one curriculum that is really aligned with the decade, decades of uh, brain research that's out there on how children acquire language and literacy skills. Um, and so as a school, we really made an intentional move to really lean into our historical data, which has consistently shown what um, uh, that we've seen the statistics that we saw earlier uh, in terms of different populations. So we've consistently seen persistent gaps that exist between our students by race, at risk population, um, students with disabilities. And so our way of um, really leaning into that historical data was uh, thinking about how can we interrupt the inequities that were have been created and perpetuated 
Um, and we have done this through really leveling the playing field by adopting and implementing a quality tier one curriculum. So that's the first step. The second way that, um, that this has come into play for Two Rivers is through professional development. And um, we've really worked hard to align our calendar this year uh, to make sure that we're supporting the implementation and teachers really have an opportunity to dig in and have multiple means of practice and a space for really learning there. And so our goal for aligning that calendar was to really cr create that sustained learning throughout the year on one area so we can get traction. We've also included strategic learning walks where teachers um, uh, have come and continue to come on so that they're able to see um, action, uh, teachers in practice and see what it looks like. Um, we've uh, aligned the collaborative uh, grade level meetings where we look and analyze student work as a team and uh, think about what do we see and a uh, way that we can align our instruction and um, revisit. And then specifically around professional development, we've been really responsive by created, creating targeted PD. And so really those learning walks have been an avenue of really collecting data along with those collaborative sessions with teachers to think about how we can really align what we're doing in professional development that's addressing what teachers need. And so this structure has really allowed us to learn together, reflect on our collective goals and monitor our continued progress. Yeah, as a former instructional superintendent, the learning walks are so valuable to like the differentiation of what a teacher needs. And, you know, most individuals don't, you know, it's, it's a lot of time, but it's time well spent in terms of getting to exactly what a teacher would need in terms of their growth, which is different than just like, let's sit in a room and all hear the same thing. Carolyn, I want you to stick around and, and keep us going on a theme and would love to invite Dominique to join this conversation. When we think about our, our early literacy practices, um, little things for me, like it's not lost on me that there were tons of books in my house and I got knew how to hold the book, something that, you know, you, you take for granted. But talk to me a little bit more about what's necessary for the development of strong early literacy practices, even bringing Dr. Gibson back into the space that like her grandmother took her with her to the library. Um, that's so significant in the life of little Siobhan in terms of seeing that like, I'm going to the library, look at me seeing this book. It even sparked at her young age, this understanding around there is an issue with adult literacy. And so I would love if you both, um, Caroline, if you could get us started and Dominique, if you could weigh in, talk to us a little bit more about the development of strong early literacy practices. Thank you, Dr. Grant. And I love how you referenced Dr. Siobhan's just, you know, that powerful story about her going to the library. And, you know, I think about young children and young children need to be immersed in lit rich literary, uh, literacy experiences. And so that, you know, that they can develop those solid language and literacy skills. And, you know, that encompasses a whole ra range of things in terms of really being able to read, a play on words, nursery rhymes, all of those things are so important to develop oral language and vocabulary, which are really critical for student success and are the foundation upon what students build on as they get into those other grades. So ensuring that students really have a sound um, uh, understanding of oral language and developing students' oral language, talking about, you know, in your classrooms, are you having conversations with kids? Are you building on their conversations? Are you pushing them to explain? Little, little, they love to talk. And how can you capitalize on that? I mean, how can you in, introduce different types of vocabulary? What are you doing with your read-alouds? Kids get so much uh, knowledge and vocabulary through read-alouds and it's rich, those rich experiences that students need in, in terms of the, their, their, even their space in their classroom. What, are this, what does the space look like? How are they interacting with the space? Is there a place where language and literacy is leveraged within each center? Um, are students able to share their thinking? And so really immersing children in those rich literary, literacy experiences are really key. And I can't um, 
you know, continue to talk about, but I, the push on vocabulary and oral language is really, really key for students in the early ages. You were talking about classrooms, and I, I say this to Dominique all the time, but her classroom is exceptional. I mean, I, we've got to figure out a way to just videotape it and literally show individuals what a model classroom looks like that taps into all the senses and is a hallmark of literacy. Like there's so many moments for little people to, to just learn and, and go on this, this journey. And so I'm not supposed to be talking, but your classroom is amazing. Uh, weighing on this topic. Yeah, see other people in the chat, they want to see your classroom too. Don't worry, we're going to figure this out. We, we all need to come visit the teacher during the year's classroom, it's gonna happen. But, but share with us your thoughts on, on early literacy development. Sure, absolutely. And you guys can all join anytime, uh, come join us. And, and Caroline hit on so many of the points that I was going to share. Uh, just firstly, as educators, uh, we should always be looking to develop uh, a strong love of just books uh, and literature. And uh, like Dr. Grant said, we have books all around the classroom. Uh, so of course, when we hear this all the time, uh, children should feel themselves represented in books and images and all of these things. And of course they should, whether it's culturally, whether it's just based on their interests. Uh, and I wasn't aware of this at the beginning of the year, just you know, put a few Peppa Pig books out in the library and they were all the rage uh, for the entire class. So we bought more, uh, you know, and then you look and listen, uh, like Caroline said, listening to their conversations at lunch, even today, uh, it's always, you know, raise your hand if randomly raise your hand if you have gucci shoes what uh <laughs> but this is so fun just listening to them talk <laughs> yes uh so you tap into whatever their interests are uh and really beyond them seeing themselves uh you should mean that quite literally so there should always be books and literature that they have created themselves uh whether this is pictures and then you add words um, quite often over the years, we've made poetry books and I'm just, I'll bring one student over at a time and I'm just describing, what do you want to write a poem about? Uh, strawberries, great. What's your title? What do you, what do you love about strawberries? Strawberries are delicious. Here's our title. Strawberries are delicious. Uh, what do you love about them? Tell me about them. Uh, my mommy takes me to the store. There we go. My mommy takes me to the store. What do you guys do when you get there? We look for the strawberries and then we search for, you know, so you really make it fun. And yes, I'm helping them kind of form this poem. And from there, they make their illustrations. And from there, maybe we're collaborating. So with all great bands and ages, they should be creating their own work, their own books, their own literature, literature even virtually. We made a class book uh, and then they added their voices to it uh, and their parents helped them with the illustrations. So that this should always be taking place, whether it's they see themselves culturally with books that you just buy and beyond that, they make their own. Did Did you add one you, sorry, go, you all think that I was joking about why she's teacher of the year. <laughs> Because now I want to I want to write a picture book on strawberries and I'm all in. I'm, I'm going back to your classroom. Um, Caroline, feel free to make an additional thought. Yeah. So I, I wanted to also add that um, because we know that the early literacy is so impactful for students, we really need to invest in our teachers and in their learning and development and really provide them the uh, early childhood educators with content based PD. And then additionally, but definitely not least, is to partner with our families and to really think about what tangible resources and supports that we can um, provide families and bring them to the table because um, what they do with our students is really powerful and they are the engine that makes it move, so. No, oh, I mean, I, I think if we all collectively reflected on our own literacy journey, it was what happened in the classroom, but it also was what took place at home and the role that literacy either did or didn't play in our, in our home community. And so I would tell folks often, like my father had an eighth grade education and that's, that's powerful when you think about literacy because I got to a point in my literacy journey where I was a stronger reader than my parent. And those are the types of conversations that I think we have to engage in with community to frame what literacy looks like in school and then how as educators do we empower family regardless of their literacy level to also make literacy meaningful at home and so um, thank you for bringing that back into this space um, the next question i have is really grounded in where we are with the pandemic 
Um, I often frame for individuals, at least at Aussie, we are on a journey to go from recovery toward restoration. And we will know that we are restored as an education community when following things are true. When we have assessed our students and we can continuously say that our kids are growing when we are clear that we utilize resources so that our graduation rates increase, so that ch children matriculate into the right grade spans and they have access to high quality schools. But when we think about where we are, we are two months, two years from almost the day that we closed our doors. Uh, our doors are back open, praise all of the things, whoever you look to, um, but we're still in it. Uh, and I, I think that, you know, I don't know that we'll ever have a normal again, but when we think about the new normal, I would love if Emily and Megan could join the conversation and talk to us a little bit about literacy intervention at your LEA. What does that look like as we are on this journey from a state of recovery to this, this place that I call restoration? Uh, how is that showing up in, in your communities? Uh, and Megan, Emily, Emily, can you get us started? Sure, thank you. Um, hello, everyone. Um, so as Allison shared, we're working to recover from the pandemic by accelerating students' learning. And one way that we're doing that is through targeted instructional and planning practice known as needs-based small groups. And in needs-based small groups, they're reading science aligned um, in which students are grouped based on their similar instructional needs. Um, so it doesn't necessarily mean that they're on the same reading level. Needs a small groups allow educators to meet students' current assessed needs. Um, this effort is being supported by providing professional development to all stakeholders. That includes instructional superintendents, um, principals, instructional coaches, and teachers. Um, we are also working to include paraprofessionals and our literacy partners. Um, in DCPS, we have a cluster support model that allows us to provide direct support to our schools. Um, Caroline spoke about learning walks, and so those are one of the most important aspects of our work. They allow a team of educators, including educators from the school, to observe these practices in action. Um, after the learning walks, we come together to develop next steps um, and support refinement of those practices. Um, this is also important for the work of all of our stakeholders, right? So for instance, in my role, this allows my team to develop additional support. So whether that be the resources that support instructional coaches um, to better support their PLCs um, or to inform district-wide PD sessions. Um, it also allows schools to use that data to pivot their work um, and to better meet the needs of our students um, and teachers. Um, this approach also aligns to, um, allows us to align our expectations and efforts for acceleration. Um, so a plethora of resources are available to educators um, to support knowledge building um, independently. So for instance, we have micro-credentials available, um, Canvas courses, and of course the DC Reading Clinic. Um, and then within um, school teams. So for example, the LEAP, um, our LEAP sessions, which are um, PLCs that um, every school has, um, those also help this effort. Thank you, Megan, give us your thoughts. I'm going to share three adjustments KIPP DC has made to our elementary literacy instruction this year. I'll touch on the first two briefly and speak about the third point more in depth. Uh, so first, KIPP DC created a task force in 2020 in response to concerns our leaders and teachers had around phonics instruction. That task force of teachers and leaders reviewed several curriculum options and chose to adopt the really great reading curriculum beginning this school year. So KIPP DC has implemented really great reading in our pre-K through fourth grades, increasing the number of instructional minutes spent daily on phonological awareness and phonics instruction. We now give students a really great reading diagnostic assessment at the beginning of the year, middle, and plan to at the end of the year. And along with that, classroom teachers have been progress monitoring students to track the growth that they're making. The second um, adjustment, we have been providing ongoing science of reading professional development for our teachers. And third, and most exciting for me to talk about is KIPP DC's brand new literacy acceleration program, which I lead. Our version of literacy acceleration is a tier three intervention for general education students in third through eighth grades that have severe decoding deficits. 
The reason we're focusing on third through eighth grades is because we already had other interventions in place for our youngest learners. So for the 21-22 school year that we're currently in, we've hired six additional teachers with strong literacy backgrounds for a brand new role called a literacy acceleration teacher. KIPDC has six pre-K through eighth grade campuses. So we placed one literacy acceleration teacher at each campus. They work with small groups of students using SPIRE, which is an Orton-Gillingham-based research proven intensive intervention program. Uh, now, how do we determine which students participate in literacy acceleration? We use data from multiple sources such as MAP, ANET, really great reading classroom assessments, Lexile levels, et cetera, to identify students who may be good candidates. And then the literacy acceleration teacher gives each candidate a SPIRE screener assessment, which determines the level of the SPIRE curriculum they place onto. Sometimes students pass the screener assessment, and that indicates to us that the student's need is likely comprehension and not decoding. So in that case, the student does not get enrolled in literacy acceleration. Currently, our literacy acceleration program is focusing on phonological awareness and decoding skills and not comprehension, uh, since that's where we have the greater need. Once all the potential candidate students have been screened, we work to group students who place into the same level of the SPIRE curriculum together into small groups that get pulled daily for 30 to 45 minutes by the literacy acceleration teacher. And students take a weekly concept assessment that's called part of the SPIRE curriculum that indicates whether the group has mastered the concept and is ready to move on to learning the next skill or if they need additional lessons on that concept before moving on. The literacy accelerator teachers share bi-weekly progress reports with their students' classroom teachers and their families. And at the conclusion of each quarter in our school year, they meet with the leaders at their campus and use data to determine if each student should continue enrollment in literacy acceleration for another quarter, or if the students made enough progress that they can exit the program. So far this school year, our literacy acceleration program has served over 240 students in third through eighth grade and we've seen significant growth in assessment scores, students reading and spelling confidence, as well as high praise um, anecdotally from classroom teacher feedback. Thanks for letting me share about the Literacy Acceleration Program at KIPP DC. It was so fun um, listening to both of you talk and then seeing the chat erupt with like, this is my favorite program. I mean, there's a lot of love for really great reading. Um, and I think any of us who have, I was an ELA teacher, I should have said that, um, we all know the tool that has like helped us reach our students in the best way aligned with like the assessment that helped us know that we know that we know that our, our kiddos are learning. And so I just I love when the chat is erupting um, and should have uh, also said, you know, every single person that's joining us, we are hovering right under 150 participants. You know, if, if no one has said it recently, we should all just take a moment and say thank you. We're talking about the shifts that we all have made during this moment to, to reach our kiddos. And it's not lost on me that a lot of us have had to, lot, to learn a lot of things rather quickly, uh, all in the spirit of serving our kids. And just the chat really made me, you know, teachers are, are always gonna teach. Uh, and we, we show up for a good, a good instructional tool in our toolkit. So um, as, we, as we, the time has flown by, uh, and I know we could do this all day, at least I could, um, particularly if one of you let me come teach. That's another idea. I need to, I need to, to teach. The College Board just announced that AP African American Literature is an approved course, and I actually don't know how to act. And so I'm, I'm like, I need to get back into somebody's classroom. Um, but as we think about the months ahead and kind of all that's before us, I, you know, I want to close with one question that I'd like each of you to weigh in. How do we work together all across our district, uh, regardless of your school, regardless of the ward? How do we come together to make sure that our, our kiddos are getting access to the best possible literacy instruction and the framing of, of literacy? Um, I have a master's in teaching from Fordham, and the best assignment I ever had to do was to do a literacy study in my community. And so I walked the streets of all parts of New York and I wrote about what the community told me about literacy. And so in certain parts of the city, there were books everywhere, there were specific types of books. 
and other parts of the city, there were literacy deserts. And it was something that I'd never considered. But as we think about the District of Columbia, how do we come together to just make sure our children have the best? And I'm gonna go in order of our introductions. And so Alistair, uh, weigh in on this thought for me, please. Absolutely, and I think this is such an important question to be, to be asking Dr. Grant. I often look at our colleagues who work in public health, who use the phrase social determinants of health. And you know, they, they've proven over and over again that having stable housing reduces the likelihood that you end up in the emergency room. And we know, right, that those, those investments similarly increase the likelihood that our students learn to read. And so I'm, I'm glad you're asking this question because I, I think we all have and, and all should be talking more about social determinants of education and thinking more holistically about, about literacy learning. I'm coming from a background where I've spent most of my time working with public librarians and school librarians. And you know, we, we, <laughs> we know that what happens outside of, of school also matters, right? So what, what our DC public libraries do and, and what our departments uh, of parks and recs do and, and what nonprofits like the Washington Literacy Center that, that may not work directly with students, but work with adult literacy, right? All of us actually have a role to play in advancing literacy for, for DC students, not only through what happens formally in the classroom, but also in, through, through the informal and non-formal learning opportunities. And so in this way, I've been encouraged looking through the mayor's proposed budget that they would fully fund all remaining library modernizations and add out of school time grant opportunities and programming. The, the, top of the, the toughest part though of this work in my mind is the coordination, right? And so for me, looking at countries like, like Malta and states like Mississippi, one thing that really stands out for me is, is their work in coordinating across these various initiatives, across these various literacy stakeholders towards uh, a shared vision, goal, and direction. And I think that in, in DC, it's, it's absolutely critical that we continue to strategically align the actions of our literacy stakeholders. You know, it's so, it's so telling when, you know, when you think about the coordinations, it's one reason why in the education cluster, it isn't just OSSI and DCPS, but it's also Parks and Rec and the libraries and out of school time. And so the investments are made so that there is the coordination. And even in my short time here, it's been fascinating to see how much work gets done when you actually can just call the person in your cluster and talk through an investment or an initiative. And so I, I do think the coordination is key because the kiddos don't see, the kiddos are like, I went to school and then I went to the library. They don't see the back end infrastructure <laughs> um, of how it, how it works, but when it works, it works really well. And so thank you. Um, Dominique, tell us your thoughts on how we should work together. Thank you. And I agree with Alistair, figuring out a way to really collaborate and coordinate uh, and I would say across different sectors. So whether it's the public, the charter, the private, uh, quite honestly, you know, in looking to push forward from this pandemic for the children's sake, I feel it would really benefit them if we figure out how to share resources that are working. So what Megan is doing uh, and bringing that over to the charter sector and all of these different things. And, you know, quite honestly, we know uh, teachers, we do not want to require, ask them to do any more than what they are already doing without getting compensated. Uh, but I feel like in sharing that intellectual property, uh, it really will benefit all of our children uh, in the district uh, because there's so many you know, and we're so uh, connected. I have so many friends, even in the chat. Uh, some at DCPS, some at Apple Tree, you know, all of these things. So I talk uh, and converse with them all the time and we share all the time, but figuring out a way to coordinate and do this together, I think would be so impactful and so needed. And we're so willing as educators. Uh, we really are because we love the children. Now, you know, there's nothing a group of teachers can't solve. <laughs> like if we all just got in a room and put the problem on the table. Um, Allison, our, our good friend at DCPS, share your thoughts. Yeah, there's nothing a teacher can't solve in all the ways. Um, of course, I echo what Alistair and Dominique shared. I think Caroline mentioned earlier the importance of families. 
Um, I want to double, triple, quadruply click on our teachers. Um, we have, have, have to focus on the development of our teachers. They are the access point for our students. So their knowledge of literacy practices um, and their comfort in being nimble to meet the needs of their students is, the, is going to be the direct correlative to how well our kiddos do. Um, and so I'm excited to continue collaborating across sector and, you know, continuing to search out and find, you know, creative investments and in ways to, you know, to Dominique's point to pay them for their time because they are very, very overworked. Um, but we need them to keep learning and keep growing so our kiddos can can keep moving along with them. So that would be my my primary focus. You see me over here taking copious notes like uh, what, what's my next charge? Um, <laughs> Emily, let us know your thoughts. Yes, um, definitely echoing what everyone else has shared. Um, I also think about the folks that we bring into our schools, right? So our partnerships, um, specifically our literacy partnerships, um, making sure that they're aligned to our reading science. Um, so part of the work that um, I do is to, you know, let, let's talk about your program. Let's talk about the resources and, and what does that intervention look like? So that from every angle, whoever is working from our students, that we're all aligned on what is the best practice that we need to be using um, in order to accelerate um, your literacy learning, um, and making sure that we're all rowing in that same direction um, so that we're getting lifelong results for our students. Yeah, I so many thoughts on partnership alignment because the, the right partnership but with the wrong understanding of what we're focused on doesn't equal a strong through line for our kids. And so you see schools, or at least in my level, They'll have like a hundred partnerships and children still can't read. And you're like, we need to be really clear about the alignment of the partnerships. That's really important. Um, Megan, share, share with us your thoughts. I echo everything that has been shared. Um, something else that is coming to mind though, is just continuing to encourage each other to keep the love of learning, the joy of books center to all of this because that's really what it's all about and to continue to encourage teachers to read aloud to students at all ages. Oh, you already know I'm trying to think through a read aloud. I'm like, how can we do it? How is it structured? Who's involved? Um, Caroline, uh, close us out uh, with this question. Your thoughts on what we should do to work together. Thank you. I, I also agree with everyone, what everyone has shared that, you know, I truly believe that literacy is a civil right. And every child is entitled to this right. So what does that mean for us as educators? We need to remain curious and work to build our knowledge and skills, right? And um, there's brilliance in this city. There are brilliant educators with rich and varied experiences throughout the city. And so one thing that would be great is if the district could create a collaborative learning space that brings educators from different settings together. I mean, it's literally like you're over here in my thoughts. Um, you know, the, the hardest part of the convening is that we're virtual. And in my head, I'm already thinking about like, how do we set up topics, invite individuals to ask me and set a stage for us to engage in those conversations. Um, so, so we are having like minds in, in, in this space. Um, it is 1.55, everyone. And so, alas, <laughs> I have to bring the panel to a close. Um, I really do want to thank our panelists and everyone who has taken some time out of their day to engage in this conversation. I certainly learned a lot. I do think we should talk about the social determinants of education. That is a framing that um, Representative Chang, I'd be interested to, to do some writing on that. Um, and all of the topics that we ended in the framing, but I do, I wanna uplift a couple of points. One, encourage for the love of literacy and like the love of literature. Um, everything, you know, I was passionate to give my kids books so that they could write in the margins so that they could understand like the feel of books and, and how to 
have literature that looks like them and sounds like them and then give them a whole set of texts that don't. Uh, reading Beowulf changed my life and realized I liked a whole type of literature that was unfamiliar to me. Um, sharing intellectual property um, and then being compensated for it. I heard that loud and clear. Um, and then really thinking about how we set the stage for cross-sector collaboration. Um, it's clear to me that you know teachers and, and literacy leaders, we don't necessarily care about governance. We care about what's the best tool and how do I learn about the newest thing to reach my kids. And so I heard that loud and clear. Um, yes, I'm seeing that DCPS is providing kids with the books. I think it's, I think it's critical uh, across all grade levels, but particularly in high school when you're actually getting ready for college to learn how to annotate a text. But that's another topic for another day. Um, I do wanna thank everyone for being here today. Um, Alistair, Dominique, Allison, Emily, Megan, and Caroline. You see, I didn't mess it up one time. Um, and that's because literacy is important and you were really patient. Um, I do want to take a, a, a special moment and point of privilege to thank um, our Office of the Division of Teaching and Learning, particularly the leadership of Dr. Siobhan Gibson, who earned her doctorate recently. Um, she opened this conversation and truly set a stage for the conversation we were able to have today. Um, there is a lot of magic behind the scenes to set this up. Uh, and we all worked really, really hard to bring you this conversation today. And so to everyone joining, thank you so much for being here. Um, thanks for learning with us. Thanks for loving our kiddos um, and doing it unapologetically. Uh, I do think that literacy is life. I also think it's a civil right. Caroline, thank you for saying that. Um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Megan, um, our CLFCD grant specialist and the lead for today's convening. I do wish you all a magical time today and uh, it's raining outside. So you should pick up a book and, and have some time um, reading. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Grant. And thank you to all of our panelists for sharing your expertise and to all of our attendees for joining us. Um, your participation today is uh, crucial to the success of this event. So I'm going to share my screen to share with you all a few technical reminders for how to have the most successful day today. Um, as you know, we are utilizing the Whova platform to organize this convening. So um, in a moment, we will pause for a brief break and that will give you an opportunity to head to Whova. Um, you'll wanna first head to the agenda tab. The agenda tab will give you all of the information about the breakout sessions of which there will be two rounds. Um, you can read the session details, see a little bit about the speakers, add the session of your choice to your agenda. And just as you did for this session, you can join the live stream when it begins at 2.15. Um, you can also head to the community tab. This will give you the opportunity to really network with your colleagues. You can add questions, you can respond to questions that have already been posted, and you can share best practices or ideas you may have or uh, that may have come up for you during our panel discussion today. Um, we will pause now for a 15 minute break. Please be sure to head to Whova. Our round one of breakout sessions will begin promptly at 2.15 p.m. So please be sure to have your selection, have uh, join your live stream before 2.15, because as you saw today, we start right on time. We are prompt. We have a lot of great content we want to get you. Uh, thank you again for joining us, and we will see you at 2.15 for breakout session round one. <laughs> 